Welcome to episode 109 of the World Builders Anvil. Today's topic, world building organizational tips. Don't know where to start building your fantasy world? Do you need more? Does it make sense? Forget any worries and become a crafter of imagination. This is the place that will help prime your mind. Now, it's time to heat up the forge, break out the mithril ingots and hammer. Welcome to the World Builders Anvil. I'm your host, Jeffrey W. Ingram. Let's sup from the mug of Java and build. As always, I'm your host, Jeffrey W. Ingram, and I'm here today with... Kristen Ingram. Yes, for all of those out there who are wondering where Mike is... Michael. uh, Michael, yes. Michael, actually, his day job is as the groundhog, and as you know, he saw his shadow earlier this month, and so right now he is hiding in his house. I thought the groundhog didn't see his shadow. No, don't see your shadow means that there is more winter coming. Seeing your shadow means more winter's coming. It's it's counterintuitive. I think you just said the same thing twice. No, I did not. Okay. If the groundhog sees his shadow, spring is coming. If he does not see his shadow, winter will be longer. Are you sure about that? 100%-ish. Okay. All right. You are a fiction writer. And I'm not lying. Okay. It's counterintuitive as she opens up her browser, but she does not believe me. Now, today, uh, I'll talk about world building organizational tips. These can really be used for um, storytelling or really any part of your life for some of them. Uh, these are just some of the tips and tricks that I use when I am planning uh, out my world or if I'm planning a novel, or whatever I'm working on. Her face is in utter disgust as she realizes I am correct. I have it backwards. According to folklore, if it is cloudy when the groundhog emerges from its burrow on this day, then the spring season will come early. If it is sunny, the groundhog will supposedly see its shadow and retreat back into its den, and winter weather will persist for six more weeks. That's what I said. If it's sunny... You get more winter. That's exactly what I said. And when you re-listen to this episode, you're going to feel silly. Okay. You said he saw his... He didn't see his shadow. He did see his shadow. That's why he's hiding. He's not a very good groundhog. (laughs) And let's say, for example, because supposedly the groundhog this year did not see a shadow. Uh, I'm sorry. He, uh, yes, did not see a shadow shadow this year. Which means spring is coming. Which means spring is coming. We've gotten more snow since then than before then. So once again, you can't trust these groundhogs. They're, they're paid off by corporate lobby interests. They're no better than politicians. (laughs) (laughs) It was a bigly shadow. (laughs) It was a bigly shadow. Yes. Okay. So, uh, now on to organizational tips. And I'm going to start off with. My most technological to my least technological, uh, yes. I think you said that backwards, too. No, I said that backwards on purpose, though. Oh, okay. That way it was going to shock them when I start off with notebooks. Wow. Okay, yeah. So my first one is notebooks. So as Kristen has suggested, this is my least technological one. Lots and lots of notebooks. <laughs> Yes, the image uh, for this episode will actually be a picture of a whole bunch of my notebooks I use for world building. I used to use them differently. The way I use them now is what I'm going to cover. And the way I use them now are are ways to track notes on specific topics. And uh, I actually have a bunch of composition notebooks that I carry around with me at all times. Multicolored. Multicolored. Different notebook colors indicate different projects. Uh, for example, black notebooks are uh, ones involving my world. And so what I'll do is I have one general one that I carry around for notes for uh, if I come up with an idea or a piece of inspiration about something I don't have another notebook for. Uh, so right now I'm working on a lot of stuff revolving around my upcoming uh, novel, The Steward's Son. And so when I'm working on on Stuff re- related to the Bedrakum culture, the Syrian culture, the mountain orcs, as I still call them, because I have not publicly released the name yet. Um, whenever I cover any of those things, they have their own notebooks, and I, I'll go into that notebook and write it down. Uh, if it's something else, I actually have a generalized uh, notebook that I will go in. If it's something about a different culture or race in my world, um, I will go into my general notebook, and I will actually make notes in there. 
That's where we're on vacation. I created the number system for the Mysterious Elves, which took, I don't know, an afternoon. But it's a base 105 number system. So, I mean, that's a lot of, uh, a lo- lot of writing around. And then. Yeah. And now I have a question okay. because when we went to the store to buy all the notebooks, um, you were very anti like multi subject notebooks. Yes. Why is that? I think it goes against my love of geometry, my sort of being influenced by Western culture and the importance of geometry, where if you have a three or five uh, subject notebook, it's now disorganized because you have different subjects in different areas. It's disgusting. But why couldn't you use like a five subject notebook to put the races you're currently working on? No, because see, that would be one, an an uneven number of subjects. And so there's no uh, symmetry to it. And two, um, I like composition notebooks better. Okay. See, now that's a good reason. <laughs> hey, I have one occasionally. <laughs> um, now, you can also use classic pen and paper. Um, if you have bound notebooks, uh, I used to do more of that than I do now. Um, or folders with uh, paper shoved into it, which I still have quite a bit of that uh, left over as remnants uh, of p- past world-building endeavors. Um, graph paper is exceptionally important. My wife finds it very amusing how obsessed I, I am with graph paper. Um, but you know, it, it makes for, if you're sketching something out, uh, and you're not an artist, but you want to like, say, draw a castle or something to proper symmetry, you need to make sure your squares are the same size exactly. And so you can sketch it out in graph paper. That's what graph paper is made for. It's made for world building. I'm sure mathematicians and <laughs> others would disagree. But that is a misuse of graph paper. But I, I have a tip. If you have folders or you have lots of scraps of paper and you want to digitize those, yeah. um, if you don't have a scanner, there's an app for your phone that's called Cam Scanner, yes. which will turn pictures into PDFs. Yes. And that's actually a piece of software I love to use. Uh, it's great. Uh, for many reasons, but like anytime you need to turn a piece of paper when you're on the road into a PDF, it's a wonderful app to have. It's free. And especially if, if you're one of those world builders that likes to put things on little scraps of paper and then fold them into, you know, 85 times and stick them in your back pocket. Really? People do that? Yeah. yeah. I, I've seen that before. <laughs> but that's kind of a great way to, you know, put things out on paper and then take a picture of it and turn it into a PDF. Yeah. I think one of my next tasks is to actually go through and digitize all all of my pieces of paper so I can get rid of them. Um, Except your notebooks. Well, even some of my notebooks, the ones I'm currently using, no, but some of the older ones, it's time to get rid of them because one of the major problems with notebooks we'll get to in a later subject, but you can't back them up easily. That's true. And I don't know of all the notebooks I have, how many I've probably lost or I've decided to throw it away at some point how much of the material I've actually lost because I've refused to digitize it and then back it up. Hmm. Uh, And that's a big problem. And then as a specialized notebook, I also have something called the Spark Planner, which my wife found on Kickstarter earlier this year. And we ended up buying those uh, wonderful notebooks. They let you plan things out. It's sort of, I don't know, a mix between a planner and a a planner, I guess, uh, an accountability device, you know, would be a secondary thing because essentially you can, uh, you plan out by week, you, you know, you can write down all what you want to do on certain days. Uh, you make a list of all of, all of the goals you're trying to achieve and a list of the steps you can get to go to them. Refer back to the goal setting episode. Uh, if you don't have goals, you should, because it will help keep things moving forward. And the thing I like too, is you have to sign off on, Uh, the note to yourself. And like this week, I completely blew what I was doing, but there was a reason why I I did it. And uh, I was having a productivity issue because all my stuff was disorganized on multiple computers. I had multiple copies. And so every time I go to look for something, I'd have 15 copies of it in different places. And I'd figure out which is the correct one. And why do I have all of these copies of a folder called Garduel that is probably 70 years old? It's actually older than me. That's really odd, but, you know, hey. Well, you're older than dirt. And it's so. older than computers, yeah. at least personal computers. So um, it's very odd that it's that old, but it was. And full of all of these old notes uh, of different iterations of me 
thinking about creating my uh, website and a, a lot of stuff that is going to be reutilized. But I think the the nice thing with the Spark Planner, I think the reason that I bought them and I asked you if you wanted one was it uh, it has a space for you to put your your yearly goals. Yeah. And then at the beginning of every month, it says, okay, based on your yearly goals, what are you going to accomplish this month? Mm-hmm. And then every week it asks you, okay, based on your monthly goals, what are you going to mm-hmm. accomplish this week? Yeah. So the other thing that I like about it being self-employed is that it the weekly schedules time blocks mm-hmm. it's not like 9 10 11 yeah. 12 you know and, and that's kind of how i work is i work in time blocks mm-hmm. not okay from 9 to 10 i'm gonna do this usually it's okay this morning i'm gonna do this and the afternoon i'm gonna do that and the evening i'm gonna do this yeah i think that's important too because the problem is for me if i have something blocked from 9 to 10 and i get it done by 9 15 that's 45 minutes i'm uh destroying the world in plague ink or i'm doing something that is not furthering my actual goals because i feel like i'm ahead of schedule now right now next on my list another high piece of technology which uh my wife has actually had the pleasure of working with me in this medium it's post-it notes i love the post-it note planner the post-it note planning is something i picked up uh, in my day job as an information technology analyst i do a lot of system designs and you do a lot of brainstorming those kind of areas. And I love post-it notes for uh, for that specific reason, brainstorming. Because the problem is, if you're thinking up an, a new book or a new culture or whatever you're thinking up, your your brain gets flooded with ideas. So the idea is you write down uh, an idea and you just stick it on a wall. And every idea that comes up, you just stick on the wall. You're not worried about organizing it. You're, you're just trying to get all of the ideas out as quickly as possible. And it works better in a, in a non-digital format because essentially you just take all of the uh, ideas. Is, it's usually you're quicker at doing it by hand and sticking on the wall. And then when you get done, you can go back over all, you know, all of these ideas that you've had for, the, for, for what you're working on. And then you can start organizing it. Well... This idea is really uh, about a culture's belief. This is something that happened to the culture. It's part of their shared experience. You can really go through a culture and have a good understanding of, of how it is by, by using these kind of uh, uh, devices and get all of your ideas. If you have inspiration about, oh, I kind of want to, on this culture in the real world, this idea of this culture, I want to maybe take their religion or I want to use the basics of their of this language and and it'll give you ideas of what you need to research it'll give you ideas of what you have for your culture starting off with and then once you have organized uh what i like to do is i I take them down by area of organization and i'll always have like you know like shared beliefs uh my major areas that i'm trying to build on for the culture and i will actually i'll have a cover post-it note for for all of those when i start to organize it and then I will just take those down and and put that on top, and then I can go to a computer and I can type it in or take a picture of it and do it later, quote unquote. Yeah, it's it's a great way to do brainstorming because typically we don't brainstorm linearly, right? No. You're all over the place, and so you know I found that when I'm trying to brainstorm like in a notebook. Mm-hmm. M- because I'm in the notebook, I'm like, I'm trying to kind of create an outline. That's right. You're on this one page, and this is the page that says shared beliefs for your culture. So you're sitting there going, no, that's not shared belief. I'll write that down when I get to the next page. And then you forget the idea. And you might not even use them all, but don't lose the ideas. But the the great thing, though, is that you just you kind of do a brain dump. You have all these post-it notes in all random order. And then you can take the post-it notes and you can start putting them into some type of order and you know when you're done when you stop putting ideas up there and sometimes don't put the 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 extra post-it notes too far away because as you start organizing them into areas you might even come up with new ideas and then when you type them in the computer you might get new ideas too based off of what you've come up with but it's a great way to get the foundations in place when you're brainstorming yeah, and I've used this. I was actually um, talking to somebody in one of my mastermind groups this week, and I recommended the post-it note, mm-hmm. you know, techniques are, and she loved it. Yes, you know, so it's it's not even something it just for fiction. Mm-hmm. You know, you can use this in all different areas of planning in your life. Oh yeah, 
No, I mean, essentially, I got the idea from how to plan out a new computer system. I mean, this is definitely one that's not limited to anything. But when you brainstorm anything, it's a great idea. Thank you, Agile Programming, for that idea. Now, another way you can use Post-it notes would be uh, plots and timeline. To be able to uh, track your plots and timeline through a variation of what they call a Kazen board, which is another computery uh, technique of it's essentially it's a to-do list on a wall of post-it notes uh, in its most basic form. And then you have a to-do working on and a done. And if multiple people are involved, you might have it on hold. Uh, let's say like you're playing out self publishing a book and you're waiting on the cover art, you know, once you put it out to the artist it's on hold for the artist's name. And, uh, and it's usually a good idea too to, to write down why is it on hold um, I don't think it's a good idea to, to have it on hold when you're working on something. Uh, however, if you, you're the kind of writer who gets stuck or the kind of world builder who's stuck on something, don't stay stuck. Put that idea on hold, move on to a different idea. Because, you, you know, let's like say if you're working out a story, you, you have essentially your, your Y axis, which would be a list of all of, you know, the times. And as you, you reach new time periods, you just add a new column for it. So you know how far along that specific plot or subplot is in conjunction of the timeline of the entire book. And then when all of all of your timelines are in the done phase, your book is completed or your story is done. And essentially you've made sure to cover all of your plots and subplots throughout there. X axis will be the plots and subplots. So you have your Y axis, which is along the top, uh, your X axis, which is along the side. I actually have those backwards. Uh, the Y axis would be your, plots and your x axis would be your timeline and then um you have the z axis which is donuts and snickers and since you're working on a two-dimensional board you just put those directly into your mouth <laughs> i don't think the donuts and snickers are needed in oh they're a very important they are a very important organizational tool <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember donuts or Snickers being in any of the articles I've ever read or well, books I've ever read. Substandard or... thought leaders to have missed such an important topic. Apparently. <laughs> okay. Now, the next one is a variation of post-it notes. It is a whiteboard. Whiteboards are wonderful. And you can do some of the same stuff that I just mentioned here on a whiteboard as well, too. Uh, the problem with, like, Brainstorming on the whiteboard is if you try and organize it, you have to erase it and then rewrite it. I don't like that. However, you can do a different kinds of quick mind maps if you want to uh, work ideas together uh, and start creating linearly, you know, or you can use your white, you post the notes on your whiteboard and use little uh, uh, diagrams in conjunction with the notes to get an idea of a story flow or a or just use it for different types of organizational, same types of organizational stuff. If you want to be able to visualize something, whiteboards are a good, quick way to do it. Um, that's why I like them. If you want to do a really inexpensive whiteboard, yes, we actually did this in the recording studio. There is a board that you can buy at the home improvement stores. It's a whiteboard and it's kind of shiny. And you can put that up on the wall and it's kind of a pain to do that part. You're going to need lots and lots of, you know, liquid nails or something like that. And then you just, you put car wax on it mm -hmm. and it is like the best whiteboard ever. I think the whiteboard we have is like eight feet by four feet. Yeah. We have a giant whiteboard. And I think even with the adhesive, I think it costs us about 20 bucks. Yeah. And we use it every week. It's a, a least, um, it, it's a good thing to have like my show notes, uh, when I do them, I put them up on the board. Michael, on the other hand, is lucky if I get the title written down on the board when he's done show notes. So don't, don't be Michael. It's a really cool, inexpensive way because we looked at like buying large whiteboards and they were like hundreds <laughs> and hundreds of dollars. I forget this whiteboard cost us, I think, like under 40 bucks. I don't remember exactly. And it's it was, about 25 bucks yeah. with everything. And like, it's ginormous. Yeah. And if you want to be fancier, you know, you could buy, you could buy trim and put trim around it or whatever. We just have a giant whiteboard on the wall. Yeah. Because we just want the thing to write on. And luckily my wife as a college professor has a lot of the pins. So. All right. Uh, the, the next thing I like to use 
is uh, there's a piece of software called Coggle It. Now, if you belong to my newsletter subscription, one of the free giveaways that you get right away is actually the world building mind map, which it's wonderful if you don't have, but essentially it's my mapping software. And it's another good way to sort of put a process in a visual format to bring more meaning to it. Um, so if you like my maps, like I do, uh, it's called Google.it. Uh, I believe it is the domain for Italy, but if you go there, it's, uh, you can set up boards for free or you can pay a premium version to get certain additional features. I just use the free version and, um, I think it's wonderful. That's cool. I'm going to check that out. Yeah. I didn't know about that. Yeah, no, it's pretty neat. Uh, the next item, which to me, as I get more into technology, I get more into formalizing things. So essentially, as I think, I, I do traditional non-technology things. And as I, I'm getting further down, I'm formalizing processes. I'm formalizing ideas. Another one I like to use is Excel. Uh, Excel is, one, a great way to do a, a, a case and board without Post-it notes. So unless you have a piece of wall where you can leave notes and you have cats that are non-destructive, um, unlike our producer, Ra, um, or any of our other cats, um, you can just uh, leave the Post-it notes on the wall. But over time, they will lose their adhesiveness even if you don't move them around. Uh, so what you do is instead of uh, putting it in that, if you especially if you have a dual monitor, it's pretty easy. And one monitor, you, you have your Excel form opened up and then you have your, uh, you know, your timeline and your, uh, plot, uh, case and board there. Or if you have a different kind of case and board for a different idea that you've had, you just leave it up there and you can just put, put a little X or just something to indicate that that's been accomplished. I like them a lot. Um, I, I like creating checklists for different things. Um, like I have a content creation checklist for races. And, and, and for different um, cultures, all of this stuff, I have I have little checklists so I don't forget to do things when I'm doing it. And I actually, I just have an Excel with those in there as well, too. So I use Excel extensively. And part of it's probably for my work background. I work with Excel a lot, but you can format pretty easily in there. And uh, for certain things like checklists and um, uh, that you're going to do electronically or or for like my little case and boards, Excel's a very good tool once you've come up with the basic layout for it. And I think if you don't have Excel, you could use Google, Google Spreadsheets. Sheets, yeah. And that's free. And a lot of times it's like uh, with, with stuff I, I interact with Mike, Michael, uh, either one of them. Um, I actually, I have a Google Sheet. So if he has a bright idea, which happens about as often as I do, so once or twice a year, then uh, he can actually hop onto the episode list. You can put in episode ideas or Stuff like that. They're, they're wonderful ways to track items. Especially if you're collaborating with somebody. Especially if you're collaborating. Uh, Google Docs is very good for collaboration. Um, I, I I haven't really used Office 365. I'm sure that's fine too. Um, and they might even have a little bit more a little bit more developed collaboration tools. Of course, there's a bit more of an expense to that where Google Docs for personal use is free. I, I have to say, because I, I have used Office 365. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not a big fan of Excel in Office 365. It's it's a little slow. It's weird how they put colors around the active boxes, and I don't really like that. It's I've like never highlighted used it. with color. If I have to collaborate, I'd rather use Google Spreadsheets. Okay. All right. Well, there's from someone who's used it. Okay. Now, the next thing I want to get into are for maps. I'm a very big map person. No. Uh, no, I know. I know it's hard to believe for my wife. Or anyone who's ever met me in real life, but I like maps. And if you go back to the map, map episodes, you'll you'll hear me completely geek out about them. I use uh, two pieces of software uh, for maps. And I like to create digital files once again, which before where it was all on graph paper was wonderful uh, because you could do it really quickly. However, there's a piece of software I use called Campaign Calligrapher. Uh, it is for anyone who wants to create fake uh, geography. And it does it in an AutoCAD format which means there's this idea of layers. So you have a layer, which is the water, a layer, which is the coastline, a layer, which are mountains, a layer, which are vegetation. And so as a, as a map maker, you can add all the symbols you want to on it. And then depending on what you want to see, if you want to see a map without any cities, you can turn off that layer. You can hide the layer. So the content's still there. 
uh, but you can uh, utilize that map in a slightly different way. Um, they're wonderful tools. There's another one called Fractal Train uh, 3, also by uh, Pro Fantasy. And this is a great tool uh, if you want good geography, but do not want to spend the time to do it yourself. Uh, you know, you want all of the the inspiration of geography, but let's say, you know, you really want the mountains to be realistic. You want the rivers to be realistic. And maybe you want to add in the details of where the, the cities and the states are, and you want them to be influenced by the geography. You get the software, and actually it creates what are called fractal terrain. So it auto-generates uh, worlds uh, wow. in, in seconds. And there are a billion variations. And then on top of what it auto creates, you can actually, what they call paint on climate, you can paint on geography to sort of modify it a little bit. So you get like, let's say you find one that, you know, is 95% the way you want it, but you want a little bit higher mountains in a spot. You use a tool like you're painting in, in a, in a paint piece of software and you just use your mouse to scrub it over the, where the, higher elevation is and it will just raise the elevation hmm. it will change the climate based off of that if you are once again a, a newsletter subscriber my free podcast of maps that i include in there that map pack was made in fractal train three and um it took me approximately five minutes wow and they're not expensive pieces of software either and some people have said that they think they are but one if if you really l like doing the geography, um, I would suggest that you you buy these tools. Even though, like in my book, I'm I'm actually paying someone to create one for the book. Uh, some of these people come up with maps that are so perfectly stylized that you know you could actually make professional quality maps through these pieces of software. If that was your point, the point for mine is it's more utilitarian. Um, so I, I don't feel like they're appropriate for that, but just some great stylized maps that you can you can create through these tools um, and, and high resolution uh, maps as well, too. So I don't think they're that expensive. And like the fractal train one is, I think, under 50 bucks. Yeah. Campaign um, cartographer is forty four ninety. Yeah. And for some people, that's a lot of money. Uh, but we'll get to that in the real world task. So that is what I use for mapping. They actually have one for doing space cosmology as well, too. Uh, I will probably pick that up at some point uh, and play with it, and I will report to you when I think of that one. Now, the next piece of software for me is huge, huge um, Scrivener. Um, it's oh, something, I love Scrivener. It's something that I only bought when I decided to start writing, and it is a great way to lay out novels uh, or short stories or any type of books that you're trying to uh, do, fiction or nonfiction. Um, however, I, I've started building essentially – why I call my world Bible because one, there's stuff I'm going to release on my website and that will not necessarily be the whole truth about a culture. It might have stuff about the Scrivener will actually maybe hold information that does not exist at the time frame of what I've released on my website. So, um, it, but it's actually, you know, I, I call it my world Bible um, because essentially it holds all of the details about my world. And it's sort of broken down in the same way that my mind map is, where there's an area for you to put in cosmology. There's an area for you to put in other types of things, um, your races, your cultures, your uh, basic uh, rule filters, all of that stuff. And as I get a complete copy, it'll be probably a free giveaway for my newsletter subscribers, too. So, uh, or, or if you don't want to do that, maybe I'll throw a, a copy of it up if it's good enough uh, to where you can just buy that. Well, and I think most people think that Scrivener is something that you write books in. Yeah. And Joseph Michael has an awesome course called the Scrivener Ninja. Yeah. He uses it to manage his blog. Yeah. He uses it to manage his podcast. Mm -hmm. um, there's so many things that you can do with it. Yeah. You can manage your entire world in there. Mm -hmm. It's and To be honest, it was his course that got me thinking about how to do my world in there because, you know, typically like you can set a status of something from like first draft to second draft, you know, if you do a five draft concept or however you want to do that, 
you can actually uh, accomplish it in there. But let's say I have custom statuses, custom areas. Like I could put images anywhere in mine because it's not a textbook. It's not meant to be that. Right. So, uh, you know, it's like if I'm, if I have an image I want to be linked to my culture for when I publish it onto my website, I can have a copy of that. So I remember what it looks like, uh, right there in, in, in the folder with all of the, the uh the description of, of the cultures and you can even you can have like re a research folder in mm -hmm. there it's a great way to just organize stuff you can yeah. import files in you can actually drag links of websites right into the research area and it will just create a a shortcut back to that site for you so you don't forget about that site later on it really is a it's it's an awesome organizational tool mm. and you know it's it's forty dollars yeah because that's like a Udemy course or something like that, I believe. Or? Well, the Scrivener itself is $40. Yeah. Um, I don't know how much. I don't know. I how think much we might have got Ninja that through the AppSumo is. newsletter. So I think we got a good deal on it. Yeah. But Scrivener is like $40. And for yeah. what it can do for you and how much it can organize everything and, that you're doing. And if you're one of those people who, who have bought Scrivener and don't know how to use it, check out Joseph Michael. And is, is it called Scrivener Coaches? I think his sort of branding for himself yeah we can we'll link it in the show notes yeah i'll put a link up to it in the show notes as well too and another piece of software i find kind of important for uh organizing my world is uh and another piece of software i find important is wordpress um i use i have a wordpress uh site if you've gone to look at the show notes uh it's part of the site there's another part of the site for my world and as I release content for my world, it will all go under that portion of it. thing I like about WordPress is I can, once I get the content I want for the website done, and I'm always way ahead of schedule, um, I will actually, I can schedule when I want it released in WordPress. And because I don't necessarily always want to release stuff at the time it's put into WordPress, but, you know, once it's done, you know, to me, it's done when I've scheduled it for release. And then I might have to do other things with my, my newsletter or, uh, you know, uh, other types of stuff so people can find it. Um, but it gives me that deadline of when it's going to go live, when people can actually see and use it. And then finally, uh, I have Google Docs, but I meant Google Drive. Um, Google Drive is another wonderful organizational tool. Um, why? Because all of my digital files sit now, uh, that's what I've been spending this weekend doing, uh, in my Google Drive. So I can get to it from my laptop, from my desktop. There's no no longer weird emails back and forth to myself. Um, if I want to grab my ID, um, e, uh, I'm sorry, my ID3 tag editor uh, for uh, my podcast episodes is sitting up there. The artwork is sitting up there. All my images are sitting up there. Um, and you know, I've only used like, th like three gigs. Wow. Uh, don't put raw audacity information up there. That's very huge. Mm. Huge. I was at 14 of 15 gigs when I started this process used. And most of it was, uh, raw edited stuff. I mean, my theory is, especially like if you do a podcast as part of your marketing plan, um, you know, uh, once it goes into iTunes, it's there. And maybe if anything you, that you keep it are just the um, MP3s that you put up there. Don't don't store all of the stuff because uh, it, it'll use up a huge amount of data. Um, you know, I I got rid of twenty five percent of my hard drive space on my desktop computer, and most of it was Audacity recordings. And you know, and you figure I have a terabyte drive, I believe. Yeah. <laughs> wow. You know, so I mean, some of the raw files are big. Once you get the finished product done, you don't need all the raw files anymore. Um, I'm more apt to keep them if they're text, but uh, if, if they're video or audio, be very careful on keeping them. Have a time frame. It's like I right now, I only have my last ten episodes of the podcast uh, Audacity files. And that way, like, if someone reports to me, like, uh, your uh, outro plays in the middle of your episode, not that that's ever happened before, uh, but if it did, uh, I could I could then, re you know, delete it and unfortunately lose some of my downloads and 
Libsyn, but I could then upload my uh, the new repaired version of it. You can actually, uh, I found this out this week. There is a there's a feature in Libsyn where you can replace a file. And then you don't lose the downloads. I believe that is only valid if it is within the non-archived period. Uh, so, like, it's a. I think once a month, you know, whenever your meter resets, mm. I think that's the time you have to replace it. Or maybe I just screwed up and I didn't delete. There's, I think, been two episodes I've had to re-upload. Okay. Um, so hopefully I'm right. But hopefully I'm wrong, actually, and you could just replace it if you do that yourself. Um, but... but you know, the thing that I like about Google Drive is if you're a person that is constantly moving around, yeah. you know, and you've got multiple devices, the Google Drive will allow you to access everything from any device you want. Yeah. So if you have a laptop and a tablet and a phone, you can access your stuff from anywhere. Mm -hmm. And if you're doing something like, you know, we talked about the cam scanner earlier. Mm -hmm. You can scan something and save it to your Google Drive. You don't have to say, okay, well, I, you know, I scanned it with my phone. Now I've got to transfer it to the hard drive on this computer. Yeah. It just makes your life so much easier. Well, I think it was two years ago, the first time I did NaNoWriMo, um, I was hopping around to different places and uh, using, using a Google Drive to access my uh, Scrivener files. One warning, and Scrivener might be better now. I, I, I haven't been in the same circumstance since then, but I have it open on my desktop working at home. And, and Kristen can attest, you know, to when I'm in that kind of writing mode for like NaNoWriMo, I will push out the novel in a month. And, um, you know, when I sit down at that computer, I, I start hacking away at the keyboard. And, and then, you know, we'd go over to a meetup at a local, uh, at Get Baked, a local bakery here in town and a coffee shop with some other people. And I would, I would go there. I'd access my files. Be careful with Scrivener. Once you're done with it, close it out because it will create conflicted files. At least it, it did. Uh, it's been a couple of years. The software's improved. It might not have the same kind of issues it used to, but it's not meant to be opened up in two places at one time. So, uh, uh it would be a good practice to get into when you're done with the Scrivener. If you're going to walk away from the computer, close it because it will one back up the file and two if you then end up accessing it from your laptop or a different device that it's still fine and now finally why do i go to all this trouble to organize it and this is a question i really answer for myself this week and it, it's really because as world builders as creative people whether you're you know you know you're creating for you know a fantasy world or even if you're being creative in your job and you're coming up with ideas and solutions to problems um we have a lot of ideas and we end up creating a lot of things and then we lose them. Um, we have trouble finding them again. Or I was getting to the point where I had so many versions of stuff, I was never sure if I was in the same file twice. And it was becoming a real problem, so I had to come up with a solution to organize, organize myself more digitally and you know start better utilizing some of the techniques that I know going forward to help prevent stuff like uh, inaccurate timelines in books or in stories, uh, uh, when you follow these kind of techniques, when you have them for yourselves, it'll help prevent you from running into problems either in their creative endeavor itself or in just finding it again once you've started it. I can't tell you how many short story starters I found or possible book stars I found going through my old files. Wow. You know, um, marketing research I, I did before that I completely forgot I'd even done. Um, like, oh, wow, that was a good idea of me to do. Um, do it. I haven't been using it, but you know, hey. And that's where you know I think that's where something like um, Scrivener is really helpful. Um, I know for our other podcast, I have a file set up that like these are all our affiliates, mm -hmm. these are podcast ideas, so I can kind of go back mm -hmm. and it's all in one space. And I'm like, oh yeah, I yeah. did that marketing research. There's a folder called marketing research. Let yeah. me look at that. You know, so that really helps me. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Now, the world building task of the day. Uh, this was less world building than normal, but it's come up with your own organizational needs. What are your shortcomings? What are your uh, strengths? I mean, there are probably certain things that you do well. 
Uh, there are probably certain things that you lack in. Figure out what those are for you. Uh, go through, feel free to steal any of the ideas that I'm giving you. That's the whole point of this episode. Or use it as a Google keyword uh, research to further organize the way that you do it. Um, find your own techniques. What works for me might not work for you in the same way. Um, but you know, they might work for you in different areas though. So try out new organizational techniques and try and come up with a pretty structured way so that you realize where you're working, what you're doing. And if you're like me and you have too many ideas to hit your head at the same time, you have a way to absorb it, make it digital, and then back it up offsite in case, Lord forbid, there's a problem. My Google Drive will survive a fire in my house. My laptop and desktop might not. And I would just say that... My notebooks really would probably actually cause the flames to go much faster. And I would just say that don't create a system that is so complex that you're not going to use it. Yeah. You know, I find so many times that people will find this ideal organizational system Mm -hmm. and it is too much for them to keep up with. And their files are actually worse than they were before. That's why I don't suggest people read books on organization um, because it was probably a great system for that author. And maybe other people have used it well, too. Find techniques, find tools that make it work better for you. Or if you do read the books, that's fine. But realize that the entire system might not be right for you. But there might be things within the system that are very useful. And now the real world task of the day, set up a budget on how to get to your organizational needs. Um, some of the software I've suggested, there's a cost to, you know, if you have a website, which if you're planning to sell stuff like books you need, or maybe you're trying to sell a supplement with your, uh, for a, a existing role playing system or come up with your own role playing system, you need a website as your home base online. So, Figure out a budget of what you need, what's it going to cost you over time, and what, you know, and do this with your significant other if you have one. If you have someone else whose your budgets are intertwined, you want them to buy in too. So, you know, your spouse might look at you insane when you first come to them and say, oh, I need this software so I can make make believe worlds up on a computer. And they might think you're a little crazy. But explain to them why you're doing it and and how it's going to benefit your family. Because ultimately, you need buy-in from those closest to you to be creative. I agree. And because for two reasons. One, if they're against it, they are going to annoy you every time they see you working on it. And two, if they support it, they will cheerlead you and help you get through the mental barriers that you have towards actually creating. They'll help you break through your fears. And now the tease for next episode. And Kristen's going to be upset that she won't be there for this one. Oh, darn. (laughs) Let's build a solar system. Michael and I will be building a solar system for the world of Podcastia, probably. Or maybe I'll just talk about the one for Garduel. I don't know yet. Depends on how much time I have to do research before time. And as always, make sure to go to Garduel.com. That's G-A-R-D-U-L.com for the show notes. It'll be under podcasting, world builders, and that's a great place to get all of the information from the episode that you've just listened to and to see all the resources that we've talked about in this episode. Thanks for joining us in this episode of the World Builders and please be sure to rate and review us in iTunes and please help get the word out to your friends about our show. And join me, Jeffrey W. Ingram at Garduel.com to see the progress of my world and learn why I made the choices I did. And please contact me and let me know the topics you would love to hear in the future. Now strike while the myth rolls high.